Hey everybody, welcome to the podcast. It's day 39, September 28th, and I am here to share something with you about overtime. It's in the news, it's everywhere. Trump's talking about it at his rallies this weekend, but I thought we should just get into it really quick and help you understand what's going on because there's definitely some hijinks happening and you need to know about it. For real, overtime is on the ballot. It sounds weird, but it is. And it's on the ballot... <laughs> It's on the ballot because Trump is using it as bait. So it's chum in the water, right? Everybody cares about overtime. I remember being an hourly employee and like dying for overtime. It was a lifesaver. It was a way I could get through. You know, it was that extra. There's when you're living paycheck to paycheck, extra means everything, right? Having a little bit of uh, money to put the bank to have for purchase, like something you want to buy or a night out or whatever. I loved getting overtime when I was back in the day, back before I was a, uh, what do they, they call it? a regular employee that, you know, uh, exempt, exempt and non-exempt. That's how long it's been. I haven't, I don't even remember anymore, but you'd be a non-exempt and you get hourly and you get overtime. And if you're exempt, you had to suck it up and work all the time, which was supposedly worth it. I suppose it was, but boy, did that get out of control. All right. So the rules around the overtime in America are changing and the upcoming election could decide whether workers earn more or less. It all depends on how you vote. And I'm serious. How deeply you care about our democracy and workers' rights. Those are the things. So we know we've got the Democrats that are pro-union, um, strong unions, worker worker protections, bring work back to America, try to get some of our factories to stop leaving, um, put a higher value in incentives together to help our economy. Boom, right? Even giving money to Ukraine helps our own economy because we build that stuff here. So by we give the money to Ukraine, but the thing is we don't really write them a check. We, we allocate that money towards UK, Ukraine, but we get the jobs and we build the stuff, which is amazing. It's just basically the government paying to have that happen. So it's really, th- those kind of things stimulate our economy. They're good for us. As much as you want to pretend like they're not, they're good for us. So just go do the research, you know, find out these are good things. So this idea of overtime being in play, coming from the Republicans is interesting because the Republicans haven't budged on the financial minimum wage or federal minimum wage in decades. Republicans are not pro-worker. They never really have been. And Trump's done an amazing job just this weekend of pointing that out because he's actually come out and said he hates overtime. He hates paying overtime. And he will actually fire people and hire other people to keep from paying overtime. So there's there's how you there's how the wealthy perceive overtime. And I actually think that's a really fucked up point of view, to be perfectly honest, because that's not really how people see overtime. If you are an employer and you know you have an excuse coming for overtime, you budget for it and you plan for it. You don't avoid it and want to punish the workers for doing what you need them to do. I'm working for you, sir. I'm here for, I didn't come here to just hang out and be friends with you. I came for the work and I came to make money. So I'm not a living poor, right? I'm going to be a living, not poor. So the fact that he actually will do everything possible, everything within his power. And we know actually he's got a huge reputation for not paying people, period. So it means nothing to him to, to deny overtime, nothing at all. It doesn't matter if it's illegal. As we've seen with this man, Donald Trump, he doesn't care what's legal and what's not legal. He just believes he's allowed to do whatever he wants in this world. That's his whole MO. And if you happen to be a Trump fan and you think that's cool, he's screwing you too. So. You might think it's badass, but you're part of the grist in his mill. You are part of what he is grinding up to keep himself fat and happy. Please see yesterday's podcast about the Trump watch. All right. So let us let me just tell you a little bit about overtime. You probably know if you've grown up in America, there's a good chance almost all of us have touched overtime at some point or, or another. If you haven't, you're probably so elite that the only time you think about overtime is Never. Sorry, I was going to say when your employees have to work more, but you don't think about it. You, you you have no awareness. So you're not listening to my podcast either. So there we go. In the U.S., overtime laws are set by the Fair Labor Standards Act. That is part of the U.S. Department of Labor. That act came as part of the Department of Labor, and it ensures that most workers who put in 40 hours a week receive time and a half for extra hours. So once you hit 40, any hours over that within the work week, so 40 is your work week. Any hours over 40 is X is time and a half. The federal law has been the backbone of wage protection for years because in the olden days, people were exploited, right? This was a big deal. Uh, but the states can have even more strict rules. 
For example, in California, uh, we pay overtime for hours work beyond a single eight hour day. That's a very, wait for it, liberal approach to overtime. But hey, we're in a state that really honors work and, and honors treating people fairly. I would say that's probably us having the wealth that we have in California because we work hard and we're a big state and we do a lot of good business and we do a lot to improve the whole nation's economy. We are hard on ourselves. And that does make doing business here a little more expensive. But the upside is you attract lovely people like me. No, you attract people who want to be part of this. So it, it kind of, it all belongs together. We're, we don't focus on treating each other badly in California to the extent that it happens in other states. I know it still happens here. I do not have on rose-colored glasses. They're actually computer glasses. They are not rose-colored. But, but I do know, and I tend to be a little Pollyanna, a little bit, because I'm an optimist. But I also know that there's ugly truths out there in California too. So I'm not telling you California is perfect, not in any way, straight or form. But I am telling you right now, we have an ethos and a governor who's trying hard to honor workers. And that's that's very, very good. Okay, so let's talk about why overtime is so important. It seems like something like my baby, it's just the exception to the rule. It's not the rule, right? So why are we talking about this exception so much? Well, we're talking about it because Trump's brought it up and made it part of his campaign, but I'm gonna reveal to you what's really going on. Overtime is important for millions of Americans because it makes a big difference. Like I started off at the top, like that extra money is key. Around 55% of U.S. workers are eligible for overtime. Dudes, that's more than half are eligible for overtime. That's pretty amazing. 34 million work more than 40 hours a week. 34 millions of, millions of us, 34 million of us are working more than 40 hours a week. And I, I don't know if that's the exempt people where like the jobs I take, they expect you to work more, to, more than 40 hours a week. You're expected to basically be on on, on call 24-7. I'm starting to think of what to call it. I'm not a doctor, so, but I guess it is on call. Available. Available. That's something that's very Silicon Valley. So, I mean, that's my point of view is Silicon Valley. So I just want to make sure I clarify that this is not working in a manufacturing plant or anything like that. But we have 34 million people working more than 40 hours a week. And overtime pay helps many of these families make ends meet, especially in healthcare, food service, and retail. Which, by the way, I want you to say those again, because think about the level of humanity you need for these jobs. Healthcare, food service, and retail. Retail is still human. It's still a very human process especially good retail is still a very human intensive process. So that those are the industries hardest hit and most likely to tap over time. So here's Trump's plan. Trump's plan is to have no taxes on overtime. So you get your regular paycheck for your regular hours. And then the hours that you worked over, he would say those dollars are tax-free, not your regular wage, but your surplus is tax-free. That's what he's suggesting. He wants to eliminate the income taxes on overcome. Oh, okay. It's really important you remember this part. It's income taxes. He wants to remove the income tax on overtime pay. The plan targets workers who work in extra hours beyond the standard 40 hour work week. Trump's idea is if you're straightforward, if you're working overtime, you shouldn't have to pay additional taxes on the income you earn for those extra hours. This, that's interesting, right? I'm interested. Like, ears up. You're going to tell me I can get extra money but I don't have to pay taxes on it. Oh, sounds good. Sounds like a side gig if you ask me, but that's okay. You know, those people that have owned the washers and dryers at apartments, that's all cash. Did you know that? I didn't know that. I have friends that own properties and they pay for things in quarters. It's unreported income. Holy crap, who knew? Okay, anyway, sorry. There's some tea I just spilled for you. I didn't know about that. So you this this idea of not taxing those extra hours could financially boost many hourly workers, especially those who rely on overtime to supplement their wages. By removing the taxes on the overtime, Trump is aiming to increase the take-home pay for workers and encourage people to work more hours. Starting to creep in, right? Encouraging people to work more hours. A little bit more about how to exploit people, but let's just stay with this. Let's just stay right here in this pretty happy place. I work overtime. I don't have to pay um, payroll taxes on it. The logic behind this proposal is that by providing an incentive over time, it will stimulate the economy and it will make people, it will make the economy more active 
and reward hardworking Americans. So it's really important here that you need to understand that Trump is saying the reward comes after you work 40 hours. That's a little hard to hear because that's a lot of hours to work. In fact, it's interesting to listen to young people go, well, I don't even know when I'm supposed to do anything. I come home and I'm so tired. And I flop into my chair and I don't even want to make myself food. And I'm supposed to grocery shop and socialize and do all these other things after working 40 hours. Yeah, people, it's rough. We know those of us have been working 40 hours for like 100 years like me. It's rough. We get it. But here Trump is. But but I want you to start to see how this becomes insidious. Trump is suggesting that people that work more than 40 hours are really the hardworking Americans. So you've now been set aside. If you're only working 40, you're no longer a hardworking American. I want you to see how Trump has marginalized you in that way because it's important. And you're going to find out why in a minute. You're going to find out why not being a hardworking American makes you just average, even though you're working and supporting your family and doing everything you're supposed to be doing and trying to find time for fun. Okay. For workers in industries like healthcare, food service, and manufacturing, where overtime is common, this could significantly increase their disposable income, uh, the workers. Trump's rhetoric appeals to the idea of rewarding effort. For those willing to work more, they are allowed to keep more of their earnings without the government taking a cut. So that's the rationale, right? You're willing to work more than 40 hours a week. We're going to be here for you and not take that extra little, not take the taxes out of that extra little bit because you should be allowed to keep earning. Let's have you keep earning. You don't need to have, worry about the government taking a cut. But here's what the consequences are for those actions. So Trump's plan, well, it's not really a plan. It's more of a concept of a plan because here's what happens when you start taking away the payroll taxes that as a nation, we've already been used to getting paid on. So the nation, this is not... This is saying we will collect no taxes on overtime, but we've been collecting taxes on overtime for decades. So just hold that in your head. All of a sudden, when the pitcher was always full, because we knew what we were getting from payroll taxes for overtime, suddenly the pitcher of overtime payroll taxes will be empty. There will be no revenue there, none. When that happens, experts estimate that eliminating taxes on overtime pay could cost the United States up to 1.1 trillion over 10 years. Trillion. Now we're up and we've gone from million to billion. To trillion over 10 years. That's a significant hit. These figures raise concerns about how the federal government would offset the lost revenue. Remember, Trump doesn't want to raise taxes on the rich. No. He wants to privatize everything. He wants free markets to command all of our lives, even if some of the things that he's putting in the free markets have no business being in a free market. That's how he wants to roll. These figures will, this proposal might benefit workers in the short term in the next couple of years, but it risks long-term fiscal consequences and especially will hit certain programs hard. And now you will see the evil in the plan, the programs that will be uh, defunded as a result of not making the payroll taxes. Social Security and Medicare. That's what's on the list, those two social programs. So you see how you get all excited about Trump's big idea until you find out what you're going to give up in exchange for not paying payroll taxes on your overtime. Now, let's just say your overtime is an additional 300 bucks. The payroll tax on that, well, let's say if it's 10%, it's 30. If it's 20%, it's 60. So you would be giving up 60 bucks, let's say at 20%, and that's a high tax rate. But 20%, so you give up $60 on every 300 so that you would no longer have Medicare and Social Security in the future. Might just take out some nails and ram them into your own body because you are just being an idiot. You have just cut off your nose to spite your face. Can I think of any more like little things like that, little items? Anyway, the point is you always have to follow the money all the way through, but it gets worse. Payroll taxes fund Social Security and Medicare, and any reduction in tax revenue would jeopardize their sustainability. But the proposal leaves some more questions unanswered. While it will be beneficial to some, it leaves out salaried workers and high earners who aren't eligible for overtime and raising the question about inequitable tax cuts. So that's important because 
these are designed, the, the overtime is designed to help workers. And that's very uh, one-to-one correspondence, right? You work the overtime and you get the money. But now if we're just saying there's a whole group of people who don't get have to pay taxes because they work more than 40 hours a week. Well, I work more than 40 hours a week and some of them are really shitty extra hours. I got to tell you. I mean, I'm one of those people who can deliver the goods in my 40 hours. I'm pretty damn fast and good. So why can't I have some tax-free money? By framing the plan as targeted benefit for hourly workers, cap, tr- Trump taps into a specific voting base, but the intended or the unintended consequences of this tax policy are uncertain and most likely to impact the very people he's tar- targeting. So what's really interesting to me is that he's always good at, about, uh, good at offering proposals that target the poor, or somehow he makes it look like it's for the poor. But the fact is, what he's really doing is just using them as pawns in his plan. And and it makes me angry because the poor have the least amount of time to deal with bullshit. They're least likely to have an education or at least a a comprehensive understanding. If you've been raised poor, and if you ever want to learn about being raised poor, watch the comedian Josh Johnson. I particularly liked his show, The 2023 comedy hour of josh johnson you've seen snippets of him on social media i'm sure he's he's very contemporary and um good but he talks a lot about being raised poor and it's a whole different reality people it's not just not having money it's that how you come to the world is completely bullshit like you might buy your groceries at dollar general why because you might live in an area that's so poor that that's the only grocery store you get and if Dollar General is what you think a grocery store is, you're already now functioning in society at a deficit, right? So this is the thing that makes me so angry about Trump and Vance and the GOP is they target the people who have the least ability to fight this evil overlord shit. So that's what we're here to do, all of us collectively as both Harris voters and supporters, but also as fellow human beings who care about one another, which you know is my my bias, right? I come to this with a humanistic approach, and I really care about social, civil, human rights, justice. That stuff matters to me. And this targeting the poor and telling them they're going to get tax-free overtime and not tell them what the consequences will be makes me ill. But wait, it gets worse. Because I believe, if you've been following me, I believe Vance is in the queue to take over, right? I think that's what Peter Thiel and Elon want. I think that's what all the white men of the Federal Society, the Heritage Foundation want. They want J.D. Vance because the guy is a puppet. He's a different kind of puppet from Trump. Trump's the kind of puppet who will go out and make noise and get people to vote. J.D. does not attract voters. You can tell there is nobody attracted to J.D. But he does what he's told. A lot like Mike Johnson, actually. Uh, he just does what he's told. He has no inner soul, right? He he can change and morph and become whoever he needs to be for the moment. We've seen this. It is his history. That is nothing authentic about J.D. Vance. So if we know that, and if we believe, like I do, if you believe like I do, that Project 2025 is just waiting in the wings because Trump doesn't have a plan. We all know he doesn't even have a concept of a plan. Why? Because he doesn't need plans. This man is not here to govern. Trump has never been here to govern. The people who want to govern are the people behind Project 25, and they include 2025, and they include people like Stephen Miller. Guys, these are some really twisted you-know-whats. So you need to pay attention because now here comes Project 2025. I'm going to skip the part that says the fiscal conservatives don't like Trump, Trump's plan because it raises the national debt up the butt. So that's in the blog. If you want to read about the fiscal conservatives not liking this plan, but it, the, the reality is at $1.1 trillion over 10 years, this is just one way Trump's planning to raise the deficit. He's going to increase the deficit so fast our heads will spin. It is something like five times greater than what the Democrats are proposing which when you look at it five times greater, those would be exponentially greater. It's not just times greater, it's exponentially greater. Okay, so here's project 2025. Sorry, get to the point, Jen. What 2025, when you go into project 2025 and read about what it wants to do with overtime, it wants to eliminate overtime. The plan, the reason Trump can be so generous, so magnanimous, so incredibly delightful and still in a rally speech say he hates overtime and he refuses to pay it. That's how far the monkey is outside the cage right now is he's he's out there saying he doesn't want taxes on overtime because somebody told him that's a brilliant thing to say. 
because Project 2025 is going to take overtime away. And the monkey still can't get it right because he knows he hates overtime. He is so transparent. But 2025 is has a different approach to overtime that could take it away altogether. And here's what they do. The plan calls for employers to calculate work hours by the month no longer by the day as in California or by the week as in the federal government today, but by the month, which means, which is very much, much, much more the Silicon Valley model. This is how being an exempt employee works. One week we have a launch and, and, and for the three weeks before the launch, we bust our buns. We work so much, weekends, everything. The week after the launch, a lot of us <clears throat> work from home, which means we're just doing laundry, buying groceries, cleaning up our houses, doing doctor's appointments, all the things you can't do during the lead up. So what you get is an aggregated month of work, right? You work 160 hours in the month, but sometimes you're working 12 hour days and sometimes you're not working at all. I mean, you just balance it, you load balance, right? So what Project 2025 is gonna do is load balance to benefit business. They're gonna make, say it's 160 hours a month and the business can have you work those 160 hours however it wants. One day you might work 12, no overtime, just a 12 hour day. And one day you might work three. You have to come in for both because you know they've set your schedule, but it's 160 hours in a month. Can you imagine what can happen? Think about that. Okay, the shift would mean that employers could move hours around to avoid paying workers more. Millions of Americans would learn lose out on critical overtime um, earnings and the shift would hit low income workers the hardest because if we're gonna take a crap on someone, one thing the GOP is really good about doing is being consistent about who they're going to crap on. And it's people who are trying to get the job done every day to put food on the table, to maybe have a beer and a puff on a Friday night, or God forbid, a Saturday too, and just have some fun when they're not working. And yet that's who we're going to take out once again is the working poor. It'll cut their take-home pay increased wage inequality, and it directly contrasts with Trump's plan to give overtime workers a tax break because Trump does not really plan that. He could even make it a law. He could go get legislation passed that said overtime is no longer taxed, but you're just not gonna have any more overtime. So it's a very magnanimous offer. He is being so generous by offering up nothing. So here's the deal. This affects the democracy. This affects the election. Earning fair pay is tied directly to economic freedom. And what are we doing, guys? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And part of that is economic freedom. You have to be able to know you can afford to live. It's like right now, I'm unemployed. And I'm like not having a great time. Luckily, I saved a ton while I was working. Uh, it was just something of value of mine. And so I do have savings. Thank God. That's, that's how I'm getting through. The problem is I earned enough to be able to have savings and a lot of people don't. And I know that's a for real thing. I mean, yeah, I went to school for a hundred years and I, I did learn a lot so I could be really good at what I do. And thank God I saved because I never expected to be not working at 62. That just seemed nuts to me. I, I like working. Look, I'm doing a podcast for free because I just like doing this kind of stuff. So I'm telling you that Trump's overtime tax cut reflects two sides of a growing debate. Prioritizing the power of business over the rights of workers. There you go. Is business more important or are workers more important? Do we care about corporations or do we care about the, we the people? Where are we going to put our priorities and how are we going to do this? Because guys, I don't even have Project 2020. I'm so bad at doing slides. But the guys, the deal is that this is for real. Even Snopes went and checked it out and said, is this true what's supposed to be happening? Snopes Snope said, it is. It's true. It's mostly true. So you need to be aware that how we vote, that, that overtime is on the ballot. But mostly, as Sherrod Brown would say, it's the dignity of work, right? Work gives us dignity. I, I feel that, right? And I, I'm convinced that's one of the reasons I've had a migraine for four days, because I'm not working and I don't feel very good about myself as an unemployed person. Just not a great feeling, especially if you were raised like I was raised, which is your work matters. It's part of your identity. So if we care about the dignity of work, we care about people and we care about our neighbors. We don't have to be friends with them, but we care about them. We want each other to succeed. And if we want our country to somehow get through the issues that we're facing, like global climate change and um, 
cryptocurrency and, and terrible thing and, and fighting on an initial national level by giant men who are babies. Netanyahu, Putin, I'm looking at you. Y'all need to just stop it. So if we want to care about those things, then how we vote matters and how we lift each other up matters. And so I'm going to tell you that, that honoring workers and honoring work and the dignity of work is pro-democracy. And I'm going to encourage you to vote for Harrison Walls because we need to turn the ship around and stop and not go back. I don't want to talk about any of this Trump Project 2025 stuff again. They're not going to go away. I understand. I, I, let me just live in my oblivion for a few minutes. But we've got to really start to rally together around these things. And I, I'm super encouraged. People are. like, it, I, I'm seeing the difference. I am seeing more and more voices say enough is enough. Let's treat each other with dignity and respect. So don't forget to vote for Sherrod Brown. I love that man. He's a, he's a good person. All right. Talk to you next time. Thank you for listening. Be sure to rate. Oh, I have a slide for that. Be sure to rate and follow and share and subscribe and, um, and participate. I'm really excited and I'll talk to you next time.